Amen. It's a great day to be here, and I'm excited about the service this morning. I uh, was going through the crowd, kind of shaking hands with some folks, and shook hands with a guy that I haven't seen in 43 years. We went to high school together, and he came today and brought his wife, and David, it is good to see you, man, and thank you for being with us today. I've got a number of other guests here today, sometimes I haven't seen in a while, and uh, some are church members I haven't seen in a while. Good to have you with us. It's Easter time. It's time to eat all the candy and the marshmallow eggs and dress up in new clothes and celebrate the newness of spring. I thought I looked kind of like an Easter egg died uh, this morning. Or maybe an Easter egg went here to die. I don't know. One or the other. But uh, we're here this morning to celebrate the newness of life. The Lord is risen. Okay, so what? Why does something that happened thousands of years ago matter in this new millennium? It reminds me of several other thought-provoking mysteries. Here's a few. Why is it that doctors call what they do practice? Why is lemon juice made with artificial flavor and dishwashing liquid made with real lemons? Why is the man who invests all of your money called a broker. Why is the time of day with the slowest traffic referred to as rush hour? And why, here, here's one that's bothered me for a long time. Why do they sterilize the needle for lethal injections? These are things, that, my wife, I was going through this, sharing a few of these with her. She said, you got way too much time on your hands. If you're thinking about all of that stuff. But, but, but uh, yeah, why is it that we have never seen the headline, Psychic Wins Lottery? Why, here's one, why are there Braille labor, labels on a drive-up ATM? Why do they call them apartments when they're all stuck together? Why is it that women can't put on mascara without their mouths closed. <laughs> and why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ such a big deal? What are the implications? How, how does it affect my life in 2024 AD? Does his resurrection affect my situation at school? Does it affect what's going to happen at work tomorrow? If Jesus rose from the dead, does that affect Metro and what they're going to do with the Grand Parkway or the kind of season that the Astros are going to have this year? My guess is that some of you silently agree with me this morning because the truth is you're unsure. And if you're unsure and you're here at church today, then the people you know who don't go to church are even less aware of why Jesus' resurrection would have any impact on their lives at all. So let's see. We begin this series last week, um, His Passion for Our Provision, and we examine passion passed over, why Jesus wept. On Wednesday, we noted uh, how his passion provided a fresh encounter. And then on Friday, we looked at the provision of the cross by examining the seven things Jesus said from the cross of Calvary. This morning, we will conclude this series with the provision of the empty tomb. The provision of the empty tomb. The Bible says the first day of the week, early at dawn, they came to the tomb bringing spices which they had prepared. You heard them read this passage a few moments ago. So this morning, I want us to look into the empty tomb. I want us to see the impact it has on our purpose, on our life, and on our death. And I want us to see the provision that his passion provided. The first one's found in Luke chapter 24, verses 3, and in verse 6. And it's the provision of its position. Christ is not there. The pyramids of Egypt are famous because they contain the mummified bodies of ancient Egyptian kings. Westminster Abbey in London is revered because in it rest the bodies of English nobles and notables. 
Muhammad's tomb is noted for the stone coffin and the bones that coffin contains. National uh, Arlington National Cemetery in Washington, D.C. is revered for its, uh, the honored resting place of many outstanding Americans. But the garden tomb of Jesus Christ is famous for one reason, because it's empty. Pastor, do, do, you, do you really believe they have the right tomb and that the tomb really was empty? See, there is this stolen body theory. Many of us have heard it. You may have heard me talk about it before. It says that even though it was a sealed tomb and it was guarded by disciples, they succeeded in, or, or, or rather defeated, uh, uh, excuse me a minute, I got the disciples sealing the tomb and it's the Romans that do that. So it says that even though it was sealed and guarded, the disciples succeeded in the capital offense of breaking the seal, defeating the guards, and then convincing over 515 people, according to 1 Corinthians 15, 6, into supporting the claim that Christ had resurrected, thus becoming accessories to fraud. Now I've got to be honest Getting 515 people on the same page is harder to believe than the resurrection. The Bible says the authorities made the guards claim the disciples stole the body of Jesus while they were sleeping. Can I just counter with this? Sleeping on guard duty is a capital offense. But never mind that. Here's my question. If they were asleep, then how do they know who stole the body? How, How could unarmed disciples that were fearful of being identified with Jesus overtake Roman soldiers? They must have the wrong tomb then. Does it make sense to you that the women who cared enough to be at the foot of the cross would not know where he was laid? Is it logical that they went to the trouble and the expense of bringing burial spices and perfume and didn't even take the time to learn the exact location of his tomb? My friend, listen to me. The tomb is empty because he is not there. The angel said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here, but he's risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee, saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. Listen, my friend, even secular historians admit Christ was resurrected. So let's look at the provision of its power or its energy. In the Gospel of John, there is power in resurrection. If Christ rose from the dead, then he holds the keys to life. If he overcame the greatest enemy of all, death, then how is it logical that he doesn't have power enough to meet the needs of life? See, there were other funerals that Jesus broke up. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty, uh, I say pretty often that Jesus broke up every funeral he ever attended. Consider the funeral of Jairus' daughter. Jairus, uh, he he didn't even go to that funeral, but he did send Jairus back in Luke chapter 8, and she was brought back to life. What about the funeral possession of the widow's son in Luke 7? In John 11, he calls Lazarus out of the grave because death offered no barrier to Christ. And if death was no barrier, then why should your life's problems be beyond his control? When it comes to the garden tomb, guess what? He's not there. He broke up every funeral he ever attended with resurrecting power. He told Martha, I am the resurrection and the life in John 11, 25. He was then, he was at the garden tomb, and he is here this morning. So he really did resurrect from the dead? Well, I find that preposterous. I know, he he just didn't die. He passed out from stress, fatigue, shock, and exhaustion. That's That's what's known as the swoon theory. The swoon theory says that he didn't really die. 
He just passed out for an extended amount of time, came back to life, and escaped the garden tomb. Well, consider this. Once Jesus passed out, he would have hung in a Y position for quite a while. Experiments, he, he would have had his knees bent. In fact, can I just tell you this? Do you know why they nailed his feet to the cross? So that he could push up to get air in his lungs. Excruciating as it was, that's why. And then, if you remember, they broke the legs of some. Why? Because they could no longer push up. And if you couldn't push up, in a matter of about 15 minutes, you would die from asphyxiation. Now, now this is not theory, my friend. This is experiments with volunteers that have proven that, the, that in that Y position, muscles controlling breathing become paralyzed with strain in just a few minutes. Hardly enough time. For Joseph, without a phone, to apply for a hearing, be heard of Pilate, have time to send for a guard, get Nicodemus and prepare a hundred pounds of embalming spices and carry them all to the cross. Because within a matter of six to twelve minutes, a person stops breathing and will die of asphyxiation if the strain is not removed. Not speculation. Scientific fact. Established by direct observation. With the blood loss of the flogging and the further loss from the stab wound, Jesus would have gone into hypovolemic shock. That's shock for extremely low blood pressure caused by bleeding. And without a transfusion, with nothing to stop the internal hemorrhaging, he would have died probably within hours anyway. And with the internal bleeding and the buildup of fluids, Jesus would have died from congestive heart failure. In fact, pathologists generally agree that that was a contributing factor to the cause of the death of Jesus. The Gospel of John says that when Jesus was stabbed, that blood and water came out of his side. Most agree that the heart is surrounded by the pericardium and it contains a watery fluid and a lance thrust would have extracted this fluid which would look like water. The thrust would have also pierced the heart, drawing accumulated blood. And even if Jesus didn't die of asphyxiation, even if he didn't die of congestive heart failure, and even if he didn't die of hypovolemic shock, and even if he didn't die from the internal hemorrhaging itself, he had a large, deep, open chest wound through at least one lung and probably his heart with internal, internal bleeding, this would have caused internal infe infection, and in a matter of a few days, he would have died of sepsis. The Roman soldiers testified to Pilate that Jesus was dead. Now, they should have known, because their business was death. And even as they are taking Jesus down from the cross, nobody realizes that he is still breathing, that he's still alive. Nobody checks for a pulse. And if they do check for a heartbeat, they don't find one. And even, even though there's a heartbeat and he's not breathing somehow, he's still alive. Nobody thinks it odd that a body that's been hanging on a cross, allegedly dead for several hours, is still warm. Even as they're wrapping Jesus in the burial clothes, nobody realizes he's still breathing and he's still alive. Then they lay Jesus in a tomb and they roll a heavy stone in front of the only entrance. And there are guards who are posted outside the tomb and the tomb is sealed with a wax seal. And the exact number that constitute a guard is kind of unknown, but most scholars believe it was at least four Roman soldiers, probably more. And despite being beaten and stabbed and despite internal hemorrhaging and despite having no food or water or medical attention, Jesus somehow recovers from his coma by natural means, not a miracle. And Jesus wakes up in a completely dark, completely enclosed, completely sealed tomb, wrapped in a mummy suit, his entire body racked with pain, 
And in total darkness, he unwraps his mummy wrap, which would be like getting out of a straitjacket. He feels his way around the tomb, finds the stone door. And in his weakened condition, he manages to push the heavy door to the side, even though there's nothing to grab onto on the inside surface of the stone. And the stone was slid into a groove. It must be moved sideways, not simply out. He does it silently in a quiet garden without any of the guards noticing. He doesn't just push the stone open enough to squeeze through. Oh, no, sir. He pushes the stone door completely out of the way. And just because he's been whipped and beaten and stabbed, he is hemorrhaging. He hasn't had any food or water in at least three days. There's no reason to be sloppy. So he neatly folds the grave clothes before leaving. And he does all of this without the guards noticing anything. And then this whipped, beaten, stabbed, bleeding, half-naked, half-starved, revived crucifixion victim sneaks away from from the sealed tomb and right past a group of heavily armed guards. And no one notices this whipped, beaten, stabbed, bleeding, half-starved, half-naked, revived crucifixion victim walking along the road. And Jesus does all this on feet that have been run through by nails. (laughs) Listen, can you actually believe that Jesus endured six trials, a crown of thorns, a Roman scourge, crucifixion, a spear to the side, loss of blood, three days without medical attention, and then overcame an armed guard and walked on pierced feet that he somehow or another convinced his disciples that he had conquered death in the grave and that he was, in fact, the prince of life. And then he lived out the remainder of his life in obscurity and died of natural causes. My friend, listen to me. If you can believe that, the resurrection should pose no problem to you at all. The swoon theory is ridiculous at best. And some people hang their hats on it. Listen, Jesus holds the keys to life. He has power for life over death. And if he has the kind of power, that kind of power, then no 21st century problem is too big for him. His power is absolute. I want you to look at the provision of his promise. That empty tomb, the promise of the empty tomb. In John eleven twenty five 25 and 6, 26, Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will le- live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? That means that every one of us here this morning can experience a resurrection. See, the promise of the empty tomb is that even in death, even death has no power over us if we are in Christ. If the resurrection is true, then why not the other claims of Christ and the gospel? See, the empty tomb demands belief. There's just simply too much evidence. Nothing else makes sense. And if it is true, then it demands a choice. We can live forever under God's blessing in heaven or our sin will separate us from a loving God and the eternal torments of hell. It all depends on your response to the empty tomb. Have you had a resurrection in your life? If not, then your sin, the imperfections, the wrongness of your life have locked you into a tomb of death. And you're dead because the law of sin and death. Romans 3.23 says we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, any sin, whether it's dark, hideous sin, whether it's gray, self-justified sin, whether it's, undis- uh, you know, The wages of any sin is death and eternal separation from God. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. 
Christ came to pay the debt of sin on your behalf. And he paid the debt. And God provided an ultimate perfect sacrifice, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John 1, 29. He won. He arose. And he holds the keys of life. And, and he can resurrect you this very hour if you will choose Christ. See, to do nothing seals. Listen, to do nothing seals that tomb. Why not roll away the stone of your heart this morning? Why not come out and live? Why not experience true life and never taste true death? See, the empty tomb ends all arguments. It separates Christianity from all the other religions. And it counters all the isms of man. The empty tomb takes on all comers. And it ends all arguments in a decisive victory. You can't argue with truth, and truth demands a choice. Choose life or choose death. It's not about belief. It's not about acceptance. It's, it, it's, it's about a choice. It's about the choice of following a resurrected Lord or the choice of ignoring the evidence, ignoring the sacrifice, ignoring the provision, ignoring the truth, and rejecting God's effort to reach out to you. The empty tomb demands a choice. What will your choice be? I began this message this morning with several questions. Why is the resurrection of Jesus Christ such a big deal? What are the implications? How does it affect my life in 2024? My friend, listen, we are whipped by sin and death. We may not want to admit it, but most of us have been affected by it in some way or another. And we wish that we had some hope for our life, some light at the end of the tunnel. We, we might even feel defeated by life at times. Many seek anesthesia to numb the ever-present pain. We've lost faith in those around us. And our search for significance has come up, has come up empty. Some have given up, moving from living to existing. There's no hope. There's no relief. There's nothing left for us to try to fill the emptiness of our life. <laughs> Look into that empty tomb. Discover the provision that is there. His resurrection means Jesus has power over death and life. He was victorious over death, and then he holds the answers to life's deepest desires. His victory can be ours. His resurrection restores hope. And the empty tomb stands as a beacon for those searching for life and light. There is hope for your kids. There's hope for your relationships. There's hope for you, and there's hope for me. Max Lucado once wrote, His resurrection turns the typhoon of the tomb into a gentle morning breeze. I love that. You know the difference in a hurricane and a typhoon? One spins clockwise. The other spins counterclockwise. Can I just say probably never in the annals of human history has somebody went outside and said, now is this a hurricane or a typhoon? All you know is it's a show enough storm. But that empty tomb turns the typhoon of the tomb into a gentle morning breeze. That's the power of the empty tomb. The empty tomb stands as a beacon of light for those searching for life. And that empty tomb contains provision for real life now. Eternal life. That's the provision of the empty tomb. Father, this morning, 
I pray that you've spoken to some. Hello, I'm Dr. Bruce North. I'm the senior pastor here at Clay Road Baptist Church, and I want to personally thank you for watching and joining us in worship today. I want to also take the time to invite you to respond to the message. You can respond by filling out online a form which is found by this QR code that's on the screen right now, or by following the link. Connect with us if you have prayer concerns, prayer needs, you'd like for us to partner as you look for a new home church, any other needs that you have, please connect with us. I also want to invite you to join us in service. Some of you are watching us online in preparation of coming to visit with us, and we want to make your visit as great as possible. So I want to invite you to come. Our Sunday school classes start at 9.30, and we have something for everyone. And we want to invite you to come and be a part of it and part of our fellowship and experience the fellowship that we share here at Clay Road Baptist Church. Our worship service starts at 10.45. It ends around noon. And uh, come and meet us and let us get to know you. Also, if you'd like to give or tithe or make a donation, we have basically four on-ramps for giving. One is in person. If you're here in person, you can give by placing your offering or your donation in the tithe box. Another one is online uh, by connecting with the website clayroad.org slash give. And there, it will walk you through the process of how to make a donation uh, using the internet. Also, you can give by texting to give. You can text any dollar amount to 84321, and it'll walk you through that process. And many of our members uh, give regularly through the mail, an automatic debit from their check. So those are the four ways that you can uh, support the work of the Lord Jesus Christ here at Clay Road Baptist Church. I want to thank you again for watching, and I want you to have a blessed day, and I hope to see you in person real soon.